Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is the origin of the mysterious number 0.707. This lecture is predicated on the assumption the viewer has watched the sine waves, amplitude and effective values, period and frequency, and phase shift lectures, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. This lecture presumes the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with time-variant sinusoidal phenomenon. Recall during the previous lectures, we firmly established that the effective or RMS value of a sinusoidal waveform is approximately 70.7% of its peak value, where 70.7% can alternatively be expressed as the decimal value 0.7071 to 4 decimal places, 1 over square root 2, or somewhat inelegantly as 2 raised to the negative 1 half. As can be expected, this value is less than 1. Similarly, given the effective or RMS value of a sine wave, one can solve for the peak value as the effective or RMS value multiplied by square root 2, 1.4142 to 4 decimal places, or 2 raised to the half. As can be expected, this value is greater than 1. You note that the effective or RMS value is slightly less than peak value, yet greater than half. This makes sense. Given a sine wave does regularly pass through zero, note it spends more time near its respective positive and negative peaks over the course of the full 360 degree cycle, so roughly 70.7% of peak is a fair estimate of a sine wave's effective value. I find a simple picture of a sine wave delineating all the characteristics we've thus far discussed, an especially helpful addition to my cheat sheet. Peak value, peak to peak value, and effective or RMS value. Note the RMS or effective value is always less than peak, and conversely, peak is always greater than the effective or RMS value. Don't mess this simple relationship up. If you are capable of simply abiding by this rule and do not possess any curiosity about the origins of this relationship, by all means, feel free to skip this short lecture and spend your remaining time looking at cat pictures on the internet. The mathematically astute and curious among you, however, may not be so quick to place their faith in dogma and may necessitate some level of proof. The origins of this relationship is not magic, but rather math magic and can be demonstrated rather quickly. Recall in the previous lectures, we used some very specific voltage, current, and resistance values to calculate peak and effective values. However, this can be performed on a very general and conceptual level as well. Recall that sinusoidal AC voltage can be expressed as a function of time using the following formula. V of t equals voltage peak times the sine of 360 times the frequency times the time of interest plus or minus a phase shift in units of degrees. For this scenario, let's assume the voltage waveform includes no phase shift and as such the formula can be written as V of t equals voltage peak times the sine of 360 times the frequency times the time of interest. When this time-variant sinusoidal voltage is applied to a purely resistive load, resultant current is also a time-variant sinusoidal function that matches the peaks and values of applied voltage. Given the resistor has a fixed value of R, the resultant current can also be expressed as a function of time, as I of t equals current peak times the sine of 360 times the frequency times the time of interest, where the quantity current peak would be voltage peak divided by the resistance. Given both voltage and current are time-variant functions, and power being the product of voltage and current, it should be no great leap of faith to declare that power is also a time-variant function. The more mathematically inclined among you might be capable of performing this operation. However, the mathematical specifics of this quagmire aren't really necessary because on a very basic level, you should understand that periods of positive voltage times positive current should yield a burst of positive power. Likewise, periods of negative voltage times negative current should yield another burst of positive power. Power should peak when voltage and current reach their simultaneous peaks. Finally, during periods of zero voltage and zero current, power should also be zero. Note the graph of power as a function of time is essentially a wave with quasi-sinusoidal properties that has been shifted upward and experiences two bursts of power that peak out when voltage and current reach their simultaneous peaks. During periods of zero voltage and zero current, power is zero watts. Additionally, it should be evident that the power function is symmetric in nature and regularly oscillates between zero and maximum or peak power. Given this symmetry, 
one can state that the power function has an average value of peak power divided by two. This average power figure is critical to the calculation of effective voltage and or current values for time variant sinusoidal functions. Ultimately, the effective value is that imagined constant value that would deliver the same steady state power to our load resistor. We essentially seek to find an equivalent DC voltage or current value that if substituted for the time variant AC form yields the same results. This is where we must necessarily draw a line between the actual AC source and our imagined DC equivalent capable of supplying the same amount of average power. As we've demonstrated, average power is peak power divided by two. Several methods exist for determining peak power. Notably, peak power equals voltage peak times current peak, voltage peak squared divided by resistance, and current peak squared times resistance. Either formula should yield the correct peak power value, and dividing peak power by two results in our average power. Thus far, you should be tracking. The leap of faith occurs when we say that there's an effective our RMS voltage and or current value that would yield the same result. The same quantity of average power can also be experienced given voltage RMS times current RMS, or voltage RMS squared divided by resistance, or current RMS squared times resistance. This first equivalency is of little use to us, since it makes use of two unknowns. The second and third iterations, however, allow us to establish some equivalency between peak and effective values. Let's solve for effective voltage first. Given average power equals voltage peak squared divided by resistance divided by two, one can also say it equals effective voltage squared divided by resistance. Simplifying the expression on the left-hand side, multiplying both sides by R removes the resistance from consideration. We can now square root both sides. You can probably see where this is going already. Square rooting both sides yields an effective voltage value equals the voltage of peak divided by square root two. Note the square root of one is one. In summary, our imagined equivalent effective voltage equals our peak voltage divided by square root two. This algebraic manipulation isn't just a party trick, but rather proof that demonstrates specific voltage, current, resistor, and power values aren't necessary when calculating effective voltage values, but rather this result can also be achieved using solely general concepts in algebraic manipulations. Where does one over square root two come from? Right here. Because average power is half of peak power, one over square root two is the square root of a half. Get it? 0 0.707 of 0 0.707 is 0 0.5. We could also demonstrate the origins of 1 over square root 2 when solving for effective current values using a similar procedure. Using our third average power formula, being equal to current peak squared divided by resistance divided by 2, one can also say it equals current RMS squared times resistance. Removing the resistance term from consideration by dividing both sides by R, and then taking the square root of both sides, ultimately yields current RMS value is equal to the current peak value divided by square root two. In summary, our imagined equivalent effective current equals peak current divided by square root two. As previously, specific voltage, current, resistor, and power values aren't necessary when calculating effective current values, but rather this result can also be achieved using solely general concepts and algebraic manipulations. Again, where does one over square root two come from? right here. Because average power is half of peak power, we pick up the one over square root two term along the way when we solve for an imagined equivalent effective value that would deliver the same steady state average power figure. All right, that's enough math and magic for today. Like I said, you don't need to dwell on these details since this isn't a math class, but this should quell any doubts about the origins of one over square root two if you previously had any curiosity. What I do care about is your ability to use these results. The effective or RMS value of a sinusoidal waveform is 0.707 of its peak value. And the peak value is roughly 1.414 times the effective or RMS value. Do not mess this relationship up. Importantly, since effective values convey far more usable information than peak values, it should be noted that unless 
otherwise explicitly stated, all AC voltage and current measurements are to be assumed in terms of effective or RMS values. This means if you grab an AC voltmeter that says 120 volts, you can rest assured it's saying 120 volts RMS and not 120 volts peak. Given an effective value of 120 volts, it can be easily demonstrated this correlates to a peak value of 169.7 volts. Like I said, don't mess this simple relationship up. Peak is greater than the effective value, the effective value is less than peak. Unless explicitly directed otherwise, you can assume all AC measurements are expressed in terms of effective or RMS values. In conclusion, this lecture unveiled the mathematic origins of 1 over square root 2. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell you lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank you.